welcome and good afternoon. Let's go ahead and get started for today's exciting presentation. My name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner, and I have the privilege of being the Dean at the SJ Quinney College of Law. And I also have the wonderful honor of welcoming you all to today's amazing panel presentation, which celebrates uh, my phenomenal colleague, Erica George's uh, book, Incorporating Rights, Taking Stock of Strategies to Advance Corporate Accountability. My pronouns are she and hers. And as I like to do whenever we have an event here at the SJ Quinney College of Law, I do want to start off by acknowledging that the land that I currently come to you from, which is in the Salt Lake Valley, um, is land which is named for the Ute tribe and is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. So it seems very appropriate that we should be coming together for this important community outreach discussion. Um, at the bottom, if you have any questions throughout today's panel, you will see a button that says Q&A on it. Please feel free to enter a question at any time into that Q&A function, and um, our moderator will get to the question as we have time and availability. And with that, I want to introduce that moderator to you. Um, another amazing colleague of mine, Professor Tony Engi. And Professor Engie is really an international expert in international law. He received his BA in English and Politics from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, an LLB uh, with honors also from Monash in Australia, and his SJD in law from Harvard Law School. Uh, he works in both private and uh, public international law and related areas, including human rights, globalization, international business transactions, and international economic law, colonialism, and the history of public international law. So we are in excellent hands with him as our moderator. So I will turn it over to the fabulous Professor Tony Engi. Thanks so much. Um, well, thanks so much, uh, uh, Dean Warner, and um, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us for this uh, very special occasion. So it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce um, my colleague, my wonderful colleague over the last, how many years has it been now, Erica? Uh, 15, 20, um, something like 20, I think. Uh, Erica George, uh, who is the Samuel D. Thurman Professor at the University of Utah. Uh, she's also the director of the Tanner Center at the University of Utah. Some of you might have heard of the Tanner Lectures, which are uh, quite famous globally. And um, the Tanner Lectures actually originated in Utah, and, and Erica is uh, running that center as well. And um, I feel very honored uh, to be um, part of this very distinguished uh, group of people. Um, and um, uh, just in terms of uh, how we will proceed, um, Erica will speak uh, uh, for um, uh, a quarter of an hour or so just to outline the um, arguments of her book, how she came to write it, why she wanted to write it. Um, and then uh, we'll have uh, two rounds of uh, questions with the panelists. Uh, the panelists will uh, just give their initial responses to uh, the arguments of the book. And then I'll be asking the panelists specific questions because we're very fortunate to have panelists who've got such uh, diverse backgrounds um, and diverse uh, forms of expertise, all of which converge on this issue of uh, business and human rights. Um, and uh, before I say anything, before I, before I conclude, I just want to congratulate Erika on a wonderful book, you know, which is um, so extensive uh, and from which I've learned uh, so much already, and which I know took a lot of hard work um, you know, and a lot of toil, a lot of anguish. So congratulations, Erica, for coming through this whole experience and producing such a wonderful book as a result. So uh, I'll hand it over to you now, Erica. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you so very much, Tony. And I have many, many people to thank um, that made this possible. Tony Chief among them for his unwavering support. And I know that there are friends and colleagues um, who 
tuned in. The American Bar Foundation was instrumental in allowing me to finish this work. And so many of the people who are on the panel today, um, who I've really looked to for leadership, um, there are extensive acknowledgments in the book. I think I've thanked over 200 people, but I very much want to appreciate, uh, express appreciation to my institution, to the UN Working Group, to the American Bar Foundation, and to my many generations now of law students who worked with me as I test out the material in a course. I've been teaching this now since my first year at Utah in various forms. Um, talk to you about how this project came to be and what it's about. So I came to be aware of business and human rights issues as a law student intern with Human Rights Watch. I'd taken a January term under the supervision of Mikhail Matua and Joseph Weiler when I was a student at Harvard Law School and landed at Human Rights Watch where at the time researchers were working on the issues around this man's case. This man is Ken Sarawiwa. Um, I'm also now in the humanities. Um, he is a poet or was a poet, was a journalist, and he was an environmental activist in the Niger region of Nigeria and also a member of the Ogoni ethnic minority. Um, he happened to have the misfortune of living on land that was oil rich um, and resource rich and his community of fishers and farmers were being increasingly displaced, um, polluted and abused by the Nigerian military regime at the time with human rights activists documented the tacit complicity of Shell Oil Company. So the researchers at the time were looking at ways that not just the Nigerian government was responsible for what befell Ken Sarawiwa and his nine colleagues, which ultimately was execution by that government, um, but also what were the conditions that allowed that to occur. Um, I wanted to share a few words of poems by Kenigoni, and many of them were about living in a shell-shocked land, having trees dying, um, having children with luckless lungs unable to breathe the air. So very much tied to his environmental activism were, were the human rights violations. So the confluence of the kinds of concerns in this case were really the things that animated me to want to develop a course around it when I ultimately came to law teaching from practice. So this book is the result of many years of a seminar that I've called over the years, corporate citizenship, corporate social responsibility, business and human rights, human rights and business. And it takes us through um, a range of the problems that I've observed over the time since I was a law student till today. Um, the book is divided into two parts context and challenges, where I talk about international law, corporate responsibility, um, and assessing risk and accountability. And then part two is about the responses, the strategies that activists are using, that investors are using, and the ways in which businesses are responding to these demands and increased escalation of expectations to be more responsible in respecting human rights. I also hope that the book makes two primary contributions. Um, I summarize through snapshots and stories the ways and roles that business plays in the enjoyment of human rights and how business actors are implicated in um, conditions for better or for worse. Um, I've done this through a close reading of court proceedings, of pleadings. Um, and then the second contribution is really looking at ways in which the commitments that corporations are made are complied with. And for this piece, I did a close ethnographic research with um, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, with the UN Guiding Forum, Guiding Principles Forum, um, basically shadowing and observing and participating in conversations that investors were having around these issues, that policymakers were having, that multi-stakeholder initiative organizations were having, and looking to the rhetorical changes and shifts that we saw, that I saw companies make in response. So if there is one takeaway um, from this book, I hope that it is a sense of possibility, um, even though the challenges are vast. So um, we are having this conversation in advance of International Human Rights Day, which is tomorrow. It marks the anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was a part of the delegation of that drafting. She's been called the first lady to the world. 
And this document came about after the atrocities of World War II, where the understanding would be that everyone everywhere would have the same rights. And we would prevent future conflict um, and war by doing so. When I teach human rights, I start with the Holocaust, which was the um, impetus for the UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, recognizing that this kind of atrocity, um, a war to end all wars, the war crimes, the extermination, the genocide, the Holocaust, um, was something that we cannot countenance. What's less emphasized often when this is taught is the role of industry in enabling the Nazi machine to function and to function effectively and efficiently. Um, it, IBM made the punch cards that allowed the Nazis to track who they shipped and killed and murdered. Um, interestingly enough, IBM technology was also in the courtroom at Nuremberg as part of the documentation for what the Nazis did do and ultimately contributed to um, a shift in how we think about international crime and international justice. We think very differently when we think about business. So the UN Declaration on Human Rights, most human rights law is focused on the law of nations, international law. Business um, is not, businesses are not nations. So Facebook is not France. Facebook can't sign on to things like international human rights covenants, but they certainly can have an impact on the enjoyment of human rights. Um, I am a graduate of University of Chicago. Um, Chicago School Economics was very alive and well at the time I was in school, as was a shareholder primacy understanding of what businesses were about and what they were supposed to do, maximize value for shareholders. And that is understood often as creating wealth. Um, and Milton Friedman is oft repeated for free market um, emphasis on the importance of in this particular view, not regulating global business beyond playing within the bounds of law um, and moving forward and making profits. In the business and human rights context, this is an impoverished view because often law can be not in the interest or in service of human rights. The case of Ken Sarawiwa would be an example, and there are many more, where following domestic law in a particular context would be at really sharp variance with our understandings of everyone everywhere having the same equal rights to respect for their human rights. This was understood by the late Kofi Annan, Nobel laureate, who was the UN Secretary General at the time in the mid to early 90s, where a lot of these conversations were being launched in the activist community, where we were looking at business more closely. And in 1999, at a speech at the World Economic Forum in Davos, he launched the UN um, Compact, which was focused on business. And in 2005, he appointed the now late John Ruggie, a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School, to really investigate what are the nature of the relationships and responsibility that business has in a global economy. Um, Kofi Annan appreciated and understood that rising inequality could lead to rising conflict. And to the extent that we've got global markets and business moving faster than states are able to regulate them, assuming they're willing to do so, this could lead to precisely the kinds of conditions that promote conflict, contrary to the peace mission of the United Nations. Um, the UN Global Compact set an early framework. In the book, I outline a chronology of different policy instruments um, at the global level over the years. But this one was significant in shaping things that business can have impact on or influence over, human rights, labor rights, environmental impacts, anti-corruption. And we saw some of these principles translated through the work that Professor John Ruggie did through multi-stakeholder engagements and ultimately to mandate terms to come up with a framework for analyzing how businesses should operate in the global economy where the primary responsibility for respecting human rights would reside with the state, meaning a government should enact legislation, enforce reg regulation, and could potentially even extra take an extraterritorial interest in what its citizens would be doing abroad to the extent that it impacts human rights, its business citizens. And here is where the significant shift happened for the business and human rights movement, um, I argue. And this was taking, um, a clear-eyed approach to what businesses' responsibilities were. Significantly, responsibility to respect human rights. In my interviews with business um, sustainability professionals and others, this was really significant for them, um, having to own responsibility for the sphere of influence that they had. 
So at minimum responsibility to respect as understood through the UN guiding principles is having a policy commitment to acknowledge the responsibility to respect human rights, and then doing due diligence and having a sense of what your human rights impacts are and sharing that information with the broader public. And then finally, the victims. People in communities like Ken Sarawiwa should have effective access to remedy or grievance mechanisms. I mean, I often imagine what if Ken Sarawiwa could have gone to a functioning system and sought justice? Um, might he be alive? Might his community be better off? So this was a significant shift um, and much of the book circles around the before and after these principles and how they're being put into practice in a practical way. How are human rights actors translating human rights responsibility for business um, and who are the stakeholders doing that? And so the second part of the book really focuses on how these principles can be made real and how they can serve in the absence of government ability or will to regulate business around human rights issues. How can this close a regulatory gap? How can we increase self-regulation of business and shape that in a way that it's co-created with the communities concerned? Um, a significant, really interesting um, area where I had a great time doing this research, interviewing information entrepreneurs is what I call them. These were people who identified problems with different industry sectors. In the case of the technology sector, Ranking Digital Rights, Rebecca McKinnon um, founded Ranking Digital Rights to look at surveillance, privacy issues, freedom of expression issues, and comparing corporations with one another. Know the Chain um, took up the mantle of moving forward California's Supply Chain Transparencies Act, which asks companies to report what it is they're doing or not doing to detect whether or not there's forced labor or modern slavery in their supply chain. Um, know the Chain took that information, ranked companies against the standard, and was very friendly in its approach to using benchmarking as a way of identifying and sharing best practices. The corporate human rights benchmark inspired by investors um, looks more broadly than just human trafficking at a range of corporate governance factors that could conceivably impact the enjoyment of human rights. So they're measuring things like governance and policies, grievance mechanisms and remedies, and performance, not just the policy. Um, there are also less friendly groups doing rankings and ratings. I interviewed um, a really wonderful activist at the Enough Project where they took conflict minerals reporting and compared them against one another to, in his words, rank and spank the businesses that were not doing as well or were doing just bad. Um, and we saw policy change um, and interaction with law in that area. So reporting and ranking have been effective and interesting because businesses seem to take up um, where they are in the ranking. I also interviewed the gentleman who founded an access to medicines index, Vim um, Learveld, and he explained to me, he was a former um, pharmaceutical industry executive, he knew the language of the pharmaceutical sector, and his sector-based rankings and standards, access to medicines, looked at what businesses were doing and weren't doing. And later, the industry sector actors involved would be interested in becoming better um, and he was able to document that. They would reach out to him, they would call him, they would wanna know what they need to be doing better. And he also shared that he also shifted the kinds of information he would request, um, increasing the amount, changing the issues to focus on identifying what would really make a difference and have an impact. And that was an exchange, it was interactive. Um, many of these benchmarks methodologies are open in the sense that they take recommendations from both those actors that are being measured, the businesses, as well as interested stakeholders. So moving closer to a stakeholder sense of um, engaging with business. However, back to market um, mechanisms where we've seen tremendous success is the area of shareholder advocacy. I interviewed um, people who are putting forward shareholder proposals. Um, I also had to teach myself securities law for this. I'm a human rights lawyer. And um, among the things I learned besides shareholder derivative litigation, which is an option, um, shareholders also have voice. They have at the right to have information that is material to the decisions that they're going to make. 
And there have been leading organizations, the longstanding one, Interfaith Center for Corporate Accountability, that came about during um, moves to end apartheid, has been active in putting forward shareholder proposals um, and coordinating assets under management from a range of different actors, primarily faith-based investors initially, um, and then moving on to broader types of investors. As You Sow has been extraordinarily effective in its advocacy, um, targeting issues and industry sectors, and powerful consumers, like leveraging the buying power. The Fair Food Campaign has done some important work, bringing in the voices of workers and increasing um, wages and improving farm conditions. Taken together in this portion of the book, I investigate how ethical investors and conscious consumers are becoming enforcement agents in their own right by directing their dollars towards businesses that are doing better and seeking to change the policies of businesses that are doing less well. Um, and increasingly in the environmental space, these shareholder proposals have met with success. They've been passed. Um, even when they're not passed, they've become parts of dialogue with businesses and most of their demands, even if the shareholder vote hasn't gone forward, um, empirical evidence has shown that the policy changes ultimately are made. So this is an area where there's opportunity if we can persuade investors to take that choice. Now, when I spoke to businesses, um, most often they identified multi-stakeholder engagement as the thing most effective for them in complying with the commitments that they make. In the instance of the voluntary principles, when will security forces be used and who will be used in protecting assets or pipelines? This was part of the issue um, that went so badly in Nigeria with military forces shooting activists. Um, the voluntary principles on security enabled business to have their own set of rules, even if in the particular context or country they were working in, the rules were different or the rules of engagement would allow for abuses. They were holding themselves to a different standard. The Fair Labor Association works with businesses to clean up their supply chains or at least know what's happening in their supply chains and they can use the leverage that they have um, through certification to ensure that buyers are confidently buying products that are sourced in a responsible way. Um, fun footnote, the University of Utah is a Fair Labor Association member. So our athletic apparel, as we go into the Rose Bowl, our athletes will be wearing Fair Labor Association certified goods. The Global Network Initiative um, focuses on the, trans the technology sector and is the most recent of these engagements and works to set policy around issues that are emerging as we are confronting what to do with facial recognition technology or disinformation. Um, the digital rights arena is complicated, growing, fast moving and dynamic. And this multi-stakeholder network is putting forward best practices, learning and keeping the relevant actors in conversation with one another. And the conversation is changing. So in the conclusion of the empirical research of my book, um, encouraged by some conversations I had had with colleagues at the American Bar Foundation, our socio-legal scholars, um, they were very interested in my data to support the claim that we can make a difference. And so I coded across four different industry sectors, technology, apparel and agriculture, um, extractives, oil and gas, and information communications technology for points in time over the last decade where the company had come under scrutiny, either been sued um, for human rights violations, um, had a high profile, embarrassing situation in the public. And what we see at times before and after is an increased significant sophistication of the treatment of human rights in their public reporting, their sustainability reporting, and their reporting to investors. I also saw that codes of conduct internal to the businesses changed, um, at least on paper for the better. So um, this is an image of Microsoft in 2010, prior to the um, exposure of its complicity in the PRISM project, which many argue violated civil liberties as part of the war on terror and um, well, surveillance state concerns. And we see Microsoft shifting semantically towards an incorporation of the kinds of language that human rights activists had been pressing for a long time. Now, to be sure, um, 
talk, some say is cheap, though sustainability reporting, um, businesses will tell you is expensive. But I think what I take from this research is that there are different ways of understanding freedom. Sure, one is the free market, um, independent of any responsibility, or another is a conception of freedom that embeds within it a responsibility to respect the dignity of others. And in the end, it comes down to choice and leadership. Um, they're competing concerns certainly of market value, but they're ways to move markets in the right direction and businesses as well. In the book, in addition to the IBM involvement with Nazi Germany, I discuss GM's involvement with apartheid South Africa and how that was different. Um, rather than complying with apartheid laws, at least within GM's plants in that country, um, the Reverend Leon Sullivan, who was at the time a member of General Motors' board, this is also, I think, an interesting example of what board diversity can bring to board decision making. But he had the idea that perhaps GM should not be segregating its workers, that perhaps we take seriously equal rights and human rights and apartheid is a violation of it. And so um, moving forward, he organized the Sullivan Principles. He continued to press for change um, to end apartheid. Ultimately, GM and many other companies did leave the country, but for a moment, they were active in a conversation about what needed to be different and what needed to change and why rights needed to be respected. So I see evolution, I see possibility. Um, I am seeing more mainstream business actors taking up the mantle or at least the rhetoric of what human rights and responsibility would require of them and genuinely try to investigate what is to be done. So I am invited um, and I'm grateful to have a panel of experts to talk through where we go next. Um, we are also at the 10 year anniversary of the UN Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights, which the late John Ruggie crafted um, and many live on the legacy of continuing this conversation. So it is my hope that this book will contribute to that conversation and convince you that there is the possibility to change business as usual. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Erica, for that wonderful overview. And um, it provides us a glimpse of why it took so many years to provide uh, to write this wonderful book. Because uh, as a public international lawyer, I'm used to thinking about social change in terms of what states do. But you provide, uh, provided us with a wonderfully rich account of all the many different actors involved in this process, how standards come into existence, um, and uh, you know, how different procedures uh, have to be put in place. And also, um, rather than focusing just on classic international law, you've also given us a very um, inspiring, in many ways, uh, idea of how, of how social change can take place, how individuals can make a difference. So uh, thank you for all of that. Uh, and um, uh, you know, this is um, just a glimpse of a very rich book, and I hope you'll consider uh, actually purchasing the book and details are provided here. So for the next uh, step uh, of, our, uh, of our event today, um, uh, we will be uh, 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 going to the expert panelists uh, that we have, uh, uh, that we are fortunate to have appearing uh, with us today, uh, uh, to have their comments on, uh, on the book and the issues that are raised by the book. Um, so may I just uh, briefly um, uh, introduce uh, each of the panelists uh, in the order in which they would uh, be speaking. Uh, so our first uh, speaker would be uh, uh, Professor Surya Deva, who is uh, currently in Hong Kong, but on the way to be taking up a position as a professor at Macquarie University in Australia. And um, Surya uh, you know, has been working on this issue for at least a decade, um, and uh, he is, I would say, one of the foremost ex world authorities on this question. Um, and he takes a very interesting position, which I th think is somewhat perhaps at variance with the position taken by Professor Raghi. Um, and uh, I think there's an ongoing issue about whether there should be a treaty in place to actually establish you know, rules uh, or international law, binding norms. On cooperation. So we look forward to hearing uh, your comments, uh, Surya. Um, our second speaker will be uh, Professor Philip Alston of uh, uh, New York University. Uh, as Erica mentioned, Philip um, is 
uh, the co-author of one of the standard textbooks on the subject of human rights. Uh, he has been a champion of human rights for many, many decades, um, including economic and social rights. Um, at a time when economic and social rights were not really seen as legitimate rights. Uh, I think it is also fair to say that um, Philip has been probably condemned and attacked by almost more countries than any other human rights scholar one can think of, because uh, Philip is in the business of not quite, well, perhaps speaking truth to power, but certainly speaking human rights to power. And so he attracts a lot of criticism uh, on that account. Thank you for everything you've done, Philip, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Um, our, our third speaker will be Fernanda Hoppenham. So um, Fernanda's uh, had, uh, again, decades of experience. Uh, she's the co-executive director of the Project on Organizing Development, Education and Research, an organization in Latin America dedicated to corporate accountability. For 20 years, Ms. Hoppenheim has worked on economic, social, and gender justice. She also works to advance corporate accountability and strengthen respect for human rights vis-a-vis -vis private and public investments or development projects and private sector operations with attention to local communities affected by public-private projects in their pursuit of justice and remedy. She has conducted advocacy globally and in the Latin American and Caribbean region, leading capacity building trainings on business and human rights related issues. Um, she is the chair of the board of uh, ESCRNet, the International Network for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, board member of Earth Rights International and an advisor on the Business and Human Rights Award Foundation. And uh, she will be on the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. So it'll be wonderful to hear from you, Fernando, about your, your plans uh, uh, for your tenure in that position. Um, uh, speaker after that uh, will be um, uh, Ryan uh, Gellert. Um, and um, uh, Ryan Gellert is Chief Executive Officer of Patagonia Works and Patagonia Inc. Uh, prior to his appointment to this global role, uh, Ryan spent six years at, as Patagonia's general manager of Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Uh, during that time, he elevated Patagonia to a position of leadership in Europe's outdoor industry and environmental communities, overseeing all sales, marketing, environmental um, and operational activities for the board. And he's a keen climb uh, uh, by backcountry snowboarder. Uh, Ryan has uh, climbed and ridden all over the world. He has extensive experience working with direct action environmental groups, having served on the boards of Access Fund, Protect Our Winters, the European Outdoor Group, and Soil Heroes Foundation. Uh, in addition, he was the founding uh, individual member of 1% for the Planet. And we are particularly proud to say that uh, Ryan is a graduate of S.J. Quinney School of Law. So he did his JD at the University of Utah. And we, we should also note in passing that he did go to some other universities, but I, do, I don't think they have as much significance, but I should mention them here. Uh, and so this is the Florida Institute of Technology, and he's got an MBA uh, from which he got an MBA and a BSB in finance from the University of North Carolina at uh, Charlotte. Um, and, uh, you know, further um, to give yet another perspective on uh, these issues, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Bennett Freeman. And uh, as principal of Bennett Freeman Associates, uh, he advises multinational corporations, foundations, and NGOs on international human rights and labor rights. Uh, in 2018, he authored uh, the report Shared Spaces Under Pressure, uh, Business Support for Civic Freedoms and Human Rights Defenders, for the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and International Service for Human Rights. He served as chair of the advisory board of Global Witness. He's co-founder and vice chair of the Global Network Initiative. Uh, he's co-founder of the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark and co-founder of the Cotton Campaign. Uh, previously, uh, Bennett was a, a, a senior vice president of sustainability research and policy at Calvert Investments and U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Um, so uh, we're very fortunate to have such uh, rich uh, and varying experience uh, with us today. And so perhaps I can just begin by asking uh, each, a general question, the same question to each of you. And if I could ask each of you to co comment in two or three minutes uh, before we go to a round of questions, which is more specifically directed based on your experience. 
Um, so the general question would be, you know, as Erica has mentioned, um, it's been almost a decade after the business and human rights, after the, I think we could call them the Ragi principles were outlined. And um, you know, so the question would be, uh, you know, what progress has been made? Um, uh, how do we account for what success uh, that, that has been accomplished? And what needs to be done? And I suppose it's very relevant here that Surya, I'm, I'm starting with you. And I think uh, you've just outlined, uh, I think you've just got back from Geneva, or not got back from Geneva, but you were in Geneva at least virtually. And you are outlining the next 10 years in this in this arena. So perhaps you could, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, in the light of Erica's book and your thoughts on these issues, uh, outline your, uh, your ideas about how we should see what's coming up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony. And at the outset, let me congratulate Erika for this uh, wonderful book. Uh, this is about 3.30 a.m. and uh, I've never done a webinar around this time. So I think this uh, is an evidence of uh, the book and as well as our friendship with Erika. So congratulations, Erika, once again. Uh, I think uh, a couple of points that I would like to highlight is, let me start with the book, Incorporating Rights. I think this book uh, is crucial in my view because uh, it is uh, exposing this distinction that we often make between voluntary and obligatory norms. Because ultimately what we should look at is the practice. Mm -hmm. Because what is obligatory on paper could be voluntary in practice. And what is voluntary on paper could become obligatory in practice. So I think international human rights law and lawyers, especially in the BHR field, they should keep in mind that what is the practice? I'm not trying to underestimate the importance of obligatory norms. Uh, I've consistently argued that the obligatory norms do matter. But what is also crucial is that what is the practice of it? Now in the last uh, 10 years, uh, Professor Late, uh, Professor John Ruggi, I think his immense contribution is that he provided all of us a common language. And that common language, especially part of pillar two is the human rights due diligence. All businesses, wherever they're operating are expected to respect human rights, irrespective of the context where they're operating, irrespective of their private or public enterprise, small or big, any sector. The other contribution is that the discourse on business and human rights or the uptake of the UN guiding principles has gone beyond estates and businesses. This is significant. And I think that also relates to what uh, Erika's book tries to highlight in terms of various actors, whether these are multi-stakeholder um, uh, initiatives or these are uh, various market forces from consumers to investors to those who are ranking and reporting what businesses are doing or not doing well. So I think that is, again, uh, a remarkable achievement. In, in terms of uh, uh, the challenges, though, I uh, have been working in this space for 20 years now. And for me, the starting point has been the Popal gas tragedy of 1984. So I, I took up a position in, in the city called Bhopal in, in the year 2000 precisely. And that was my turning point to business and human rights. And, and I take Bhopal as a touchstone in measuring the progress we have made in the last 20 years or last 50 years. Or we can go back to 16th century British East India Company, in fact. We can go as far as we would like to in, in this space of business and human rights. And I feel that the Practice, if you look at the practice, and I think I go back to the point I started with, that we should look at the practice. So I, if I look at the practice, the progress has been very slow and very limited. So despite the promise that the book provides, and despite the, I would say the potential that the book offers, there's a huge gap between paper and practice. And I believe in always keeping rights holders at the center of this discourse. So if I ask this question about the progress that we have made, my question is what has changed for the rights holders on the ground, whether they are in Nigeria or they are at a mine somewhere or they are in a, in a supply chain, uh, let us say in China or in Bangladesh or anywhere in India. 
what has changed for them. And I am not able to travel for the last two years as much as I did in the previous four years as part of my mandate. The response I get is that hardly anything had changed. And the fear that I have is, and I've written about it, that this business and human rights agenda might end up becoming the new corporate social responsibility, the new CSR. Of course, in the book, um, Eric articulates that CSR is important and can be embedded, the rights can be embedded and all that. So I think all these are important aspects. I think going forward, we expect, as a working group, we expect greater ambition on the part of states, businesses, investors, everyone, in fact, to take UN guiding principles seriously, or at least take the spirit of the UN guiding principles more seriously. So more work needs to be done, uh, but I think this book uh, makes an in important contribution in showcasing that we can't rely merely on states. Of course, the states are crucial. And I think it is becoming increasingly relevant that states are crucial even to support pillar two. And that's where this uh, whole debate about mandatory human rights due diligence is unfolding, especially in Europe. So I will stop with that, uh, Tony. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Surya, for giving uh, us that uh, perspective. And uh, I suppose the question would be uh, for people on the ground, what is the remedy that might be available in these types of circumstances? Looking at the third pillar that uh, Erica outlined. Um, and uh, you know, we'd like to think of the processes that Erica points to and what in those processes needs to be really developed further. Uh, Philip, uh, may I then uh, turn to you and ask your views on, you know, what has been, what progress have we made in this field in the last 10 years? What, you know, what is to be done uh, from your perspective? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, and it's a, a great pleasure to be part of the, the panel. Um, I think that Erica's book does a, a terrific job of marshalling the evidence of what has been achieved and the ways in which that has happened. Um, I think at the end, my sense is that what we see is that some corporate actors in some industries, in some circumstances, uh, have actually uh, come to the party and uh, done the right thing. But I think we're still left with the much broader picture uh, that we need to focus on. Um, I think in terms of uh, factors in success, um, I think there's been an important role played uh, through exposure and mobilization, pressure from activists, from the media, from consumers and others. And I think that is a, an irreplaceable uh, dimension. Uh, the problem, of course, with that is that it can be effective. We've seen with apparel companies, uh, footwear, some of the other classic consumer goods areas. Um, but if we take some of the biggest concerns that confront us today, such as climate change uh, or the tech sector, for example, uh, it's very difficult to see uh, the sort of progress in terms of the uh, meaningful embrace of human rights uh, by a great many of the actors there. Um, the problems, of course, are that a lot of the corporate actors are shield from, shielded from direct pressures. Uh, they don't have the sort of incentives that uh, Patagonia has, for example, to, uh, to, <laughs> to come clean or to go green. Um, they're just uh, able to work through a lack of transparency uh, and the result is that uh, there's been also a little change, I think, in the uh, underlying corporate ethos, um, which still, uh, despite uh, the comments made about uh, Milton Friedman, uh, is based on the assumption that the responsibility of corporations is to make profits and it's for other actors to do uh, good. 
Um, I think just uh, to make a, another broad comment, um, it's important in this area to recognize that we need a diverse array of actors. Um, I guess it must be a decade ago now when uh, John Ruggie and I were uh, were special procedures mandate holders um, at the same time. I always had the very irritating experience of following John uh, literally on the podium and John would come down from the podium with uh, acclamation all around and smiles uh, and I would replace him in the same seat and governments would go on the attack uh, and tell me what a terrible job I was doing. Um, after we both uh, stepped down from our positions, John asked me to join him in setting up, or not setting it up, but to join him on the board of SHIFT, uh, which took forward his work. And initially, I was reluctant to do that, but we had a very good conversation. And I said, listen, John, my position is that your principles are a, a very good starting point, but that a hell of a lot more needs to be done. And I wouldn't want all the energy to go into your principles. Uh, and John was absolutely fine with that. Uh, and I maintain the same view that the sort of initiatives that Erica has surveyed so effectively are all extremely important. They do raise consciousness, they do hold the feet of some corporate actors to the fire, but they need to be supplemented very significantly uh, by uh, much stronger efforts in other directions. And I think my bottom line, uh, I'm not sure if this is contrary to what uh, Surya said, uh, but is that we really have to uh, look to governments as uh, the indispensable component in all of this. And I certainly agree with what he said about looking forward to what the European Union is able to do in terms of developing the concept of due diligence into uh, something that might really be the beginnings of a legal regime. Um, I would add uh, but this is maybe gratuitous that I am extremely frustrated by what I see uh, in terms of the treaty process. Um, it just seems to me to be, it's a migrant workers convention all over again, where you're going to have uh, utopian elements enshrined and none of the serious actors will uh, participate in it. And the trouble with that is that it takes up the oxygen that is needed to fuel other um, major initiatives designed to promote um, effective legal regulation. Uh, thanks so much for it. You raised uh, so many interesting questions about whether you know, different industries uh, might have different approaches and how we should understand that. And uh, uh, also interesting to hear your comments on your interaction with John, John Ruggie. Um, and uh, you remind us, uh, I suppose, also of the uh, recent treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons or the use of nuclear weapons, where again, you have all the non-nuclear states uh, signing on and the nuclear states saying, okay, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> um, and that type of treaty is almost a sign of desperation. It's almost like, well, look, we've got nothing to lose. Uh, you know, so it's interesting how we should interpret those ty types of events. Uh, and now, if I may turn to Fernanda, uh, who's uh, done all this wonderful work in the Latin American and Caribbean region, uh, as to um, your thoughts, Fernanda, on what progress you see uh, as having been made and what challenges we face and how we can uh, achieve the goals that we seek in terms of more corporate accountability. Thank you very much. Such a difficult question to answer in, in a few minutes. But um, first of all, I wanted also to add my congratulations to Erica for this book um, and to celebrate the contributions that this publication is making and your contributions. I'm so happy that we finally met. 
I've been following your work for a while. Uh, we met online, of course, because you know the pandemic is still going on, apparently. But um, but um, I'm really glad to be able to join this conversation. I also just recently joined the working group a month ago, and um, a lot of learnings already in a month, and a lot of challenges ahead. Um, I think that. Uh, I mean, I, I, some of the things that Surya mentioned, I already had them in my notes prepared for this first round because I, I think we, we think alike in many things. And one is that, um, of course, there, there is progress in terms of, you know, we have a common language now, let's say, right? This is part of the conversation. The conversation has shifted in the past 10 years, um, I would say significantly but that doesn't necessarily translate in action on the ground or in uh, significant changes for people's lives. Are we changing lives on the ground? That's kind of the question I always grapple with, you know, in my mind. I feel responsible to, to push for change that actually changes people's lives. And I've, I mean, I've, for example, accompanied a case for seven years now in Mexico and nothing has changed for the people on the ground. So 10 of the seven past years, these people has been tr struggling to access justice and remedy. They haven't been able to, right? And um, what are the barriers there? What are the challenges that they are, they are still facing? And I think those are the kind of things that we should be looking at more, more specifically. And um, yeah, there might be companies basically sitting in the headquarters, de designing good you know, human rights policies, or, or, or even implementing or starting to implement adequate uh, due diligence processes. But how does that translate to, you know, their own subsidiaries or the value chain, you know, the, the supply chain and their commercial associates in other countries, right? Those conversations don't necessarily translate to the ground. And that's where most human rights abuses happen, right? Uh, and um, so I think there's, there are more challenges than progress, if, if, if I may say. Um, so I think this, this 10 years have been fundamental, or we've been working on these things, calling it with a different name for m many more decades. But, you know, we've had the UNGPs for 10 years now. And I think, um, again, we have the common language, we have policies, we have, um, you know, business associations, uh, uh, you know, assuming public commitments to the human rights, to the UNGPs, um, to, you know, contributing to addressing the climate <clears throat> crisis and so on. But I don't see, to be frank, a fundamental change in how business is done. You know, I don't see <clears throat> this change as much as I would like, at least, from, you know, the shareholder approach to the stakeholder approach. And again, it's in the narrative, but is it happening on the ground? I think it's difficult to, to really find successful stories there. Uh, in terms of due diligence, I think there's much to be done to you know, develop common standards, common methods, <clears throat> to involve much more, for example, the financial sector, particularly the big players that are you know, the fuel to the companies operating on the ground. Um, and um, again, I, I really think that the, the bottom line question that we should be, ask, be asking ourselves for the next 10 years is how much are we changing lives? How much are we really, you know, <clears throat> achieving systemic change? And that, that, I think it's a challenge for our community, the business and human rights community. And I think um, having an intersectional approach that, you know, kind of, it's not only happening, the discussions are not only happening at the Global North uh, spaces, in the headquarters of the companies and so on and so forth is very important for the next decade. So I'll stop here and I'm sorry, Mexico City, it's a pretty noisy city, probably similar to New York. And um, <laughs> I apologize for the background noise. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Fernanda. And again, it raises this crucial question, you know, uh, what sort of change do we want and how do we achieve it? Um, and how do the processes uh, that Erica has been uh, outlining play a role in that? What, what more uh, needs to be done? Uh, uh, what uh, that is pointed out in the book uh, needs to be further developed. Um, uh, so, um, uh, Ryan, if I can uh, switch to you.
you now. Um, and I suppose here it's almost a personal story for you because you know over the last ten years, your own awareness of these issues um, has been, uh, I would imagine, uh, developing in various ways. And you've been remarkably inspirational and successful in making um, those concerns a part of the whole approach that Patagonia takes. Uh, so perhaps if you could uh, speak about what you see as the changes you've encountered in your particular role and what that might suggest for other corporations and um, you know the types of issues that have been raised. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. And, and let me just join in the long line of, of people who have congratulated you, Erica, on, on completing this book. I think it's fantastic. It's really important and additive. And Professor Angie, it's fantastic to see you again. I think you have the distinguished... Uh, uh, recognition of being the professor that I took the most classes from in my time at uh, at the law school there. I think it was at least three, maybe four. Um, I, I would just say, you know, look, I'm, I'm calling in on behalf of and literally from the headquarters of one of those companies that we talk about in the global north that's got a footprint around the world. And so let me say a couple of things. Um, and let me start with this. I'm really glad that I'm, I think, fourth in the list of speakers. I was a little concerned, candidly, that we might be talking optimistically. I was a little concerned that we might be saying that these things seem to be working or here's the things we should get excited about. And, and I feel like what I've heard is Erica describe, and I think very intentionally, positively, that there are some reasons for optimism. And, and I don't disagree with that, but I would say that I am incredibly cynical and pessimistic about where we're at, because I think the things that are cataloged well in, in the book are the progress that we've made. I think the harsh reality is, A, as has been framed by the previous speakers, what's changed in the lives of real human beings on the ground. And I think the consensus is very little, and I share that. I would also say that what's changed when you just step back and look more broadly at the health of the planet and the people that live on it, and I would say that we have created as humans a, a climate and ecological crisis. It is real. We have created it. And it's an existential threat to on, our ongoing uh, ability to survive and thrive on this planet. I believe that very, very strongly. And so, you know, I completely reject this Friedman approach to shareholder primacy. I think it's it, it perpetuates business as usual. There may have been a good intellectual argument for it at its time. The world has changed and we need to change with it. It's a dated idea, dated concept. And I think, um, you know, business as usual, how the hell is that working out for us? I mean, look at everything that we say we hold most dear. And if you look at those metrics and you're honest with yourself, there's not a lot to get excited about. Now, if it sounds like I'm just pessimistic or cynical, I would also say, I think we've in the face of this have lost the right to sit around and be pessimistic. I think we need to be focused on action. And I think it is absolutely critical that the business sector become more directly committed to and engage in activism itself. And so I think one of the places where I feel like we can be additive is in doing that and dragging this sector along, both through inspiration where that's possible and, you know, using other, you know, calling people out and calling people in across the sector. And I don't think any of us, I certainly speak for myself, say, you know, really enjoy calling people out, but I think there's an absolute need for it. What concerns me the most is that businesses have now gotten to a place, their leaders and the businesses themselves, of addressing these issues to their customers and to their employees one way. And it is a more progressive conversation, rife with more commitments. The problem is when they talk to their business partners, when they talk to government, whether that's directly through PACs, through lobbyists, or through trade associations, I think absolutely nothing's changed. Um, and so that is a huge concern that I have. And I've been pretty outspoken about the business roundtable in the American Chamber of Commerce, who I think are some of the worst offenders. We've got a nar very narrow window of time right now to drive change. We're leaving an administration that wouldn't even discuss the realities of climate change. We're in a very tight window and things are likely to change a year from now politically. And America has an opportunity to step up and put binding commitments in place and the same leaders of, of public and private companies who are saying we're all in on climate are actively participating in undermining that progress. And that is a huge, huge concern for, for me, for us, from the business sector. And I, you know, we're unapologetically a for-profit business um, operating within this sector. And I think that's both our strength and our weakness, but we want to figure out how we weaponize and use that strength to drive change in the business sector writ large. Thanks, Ryan. I mean, that is uh, you know, so eloquent uh, and uh, so telling. And um, you know, one thing that struck me about Patagonia is it, it seems that 
um, you see it as your active mission to actually educate your consumers. So rather than the consumers driving what Patagonia does necessarily, it seems Patagonia is also trying to expand uh, the consumer's knowledge about these issues uh, through its operations. Uh, so that's uh, also to me, uh, you know, fascinating and inspirational. Um, now we've had such a rich a set of comments that we're unfortunately running short of time. So I, I, we won't unfortunately have time to go for the second round that we had hoped, um, you know, so as usual with such complex and uh, far reaching topics, uh, uh, unfortunately we can't cover everything we would like to, but we'll leave the last word uh, to Bennett before uh, calling on Erica to respond. And um, also we should leave a little time for any questions. We've got a very large audience, 115 people. I can see something like that. So please, if you have any uh, questions or comments, please put that into the chat um, and we'll try and address them right at the end. Uh, so we look forward now to your comments, Bennett, because you again have another set of experiences that will add to our, you know, um, our thoughts on this topic. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. I can't resist just saying in response to Ryan's uh, peroration of 60 seconds or so ago that I've now going to become an even more dedicated, loyal, long-term Patagonia customer. I love the idea of weaponizing your strength. Go for it. But um, this is uh, Erica's day and Erica's event and Erica's really timely and important book. And I just want to join my colleagues and friends on the panel in saluting Erica's achievement. Um, this is a book whose time has come um, because the business and human rights movement over the last two decades, some would argue quarter century, uh, has certainly evolved and matured and it faces more challenges than ever. But this is the first truly comprehensive text that lays it all out. There are all kinds of topical books, uh, collections of essays, but this is the first world-class, top quality, A to Z tour of the entire table of business and human rights. It is indeed all here in, in one volume. So I just salute um, uh, Erica's uh, industry and energy and analytical prowess in putting together such a masterful work. Um, and with that, um, a couple of comments. Um, first, uh, you know, I think that we all grapple in our work uh, in this book makes us consider maybe more than ever, whether the proverbial glass is half full or half empty. And I think that those who've spoken before me might you have different views, more half full, uh, more, more half empty. I happen to still be, despite some of the grave challenges, the many grave challenges we face to be a glass half full, opti ever the optimist. Um, uh, but I certainly take Surya's point he made so uh, incisively at the top of the discussion uh, about the uh, the many remaining gaps, the lack of, um, of legally binding standards. But nonetheless, what strikes me just looking, reading the book and just stepping back and looking merely at the table of contents is how wide and deep, uh, extensive and intensive the architecture is around business and human rights. Yes, it lacks an overarching or rather an underpinning uh, legally binding uh, framework and maybe will uh, that uh, some treaty of some sort, whether it's what's on the table in Geneva or some successor may evolve. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we all have our own opinions of that. But we have come a long way in the last two decades, really quarter century since I've been uh, involved in this field. Um, and I think that we can be not ever satisfied, but at least take notice of the tremendous um, accretion um, of initiative standards and efforts of implementation. But of course, the implementation is already observed is so incomplete. It's so inconsistent. And at times it's so contradictory, even hypocritical of what companies may say and commit to on the one hand and what they do and the impacts that they still exert uh, on the other. What I really want to turn to and really uh, make my main uh, focus in my couple more minutes here um, are two points looking forward. And I'm going to take the liberty of reading back two sentences um, from Erica's um, uh, epilogue 
uh, reimagining responsibility, incorporating rights. And I'll co- make a brief comment after each of the two sentences, because I think that the this passage um, really points the way to the, the opportunities we have, but frankly, at this point, severe dilemmas. The first sentence that really strikes me um, is a more just way of doing business means we must reimagine corporate social responsibility and sustainability in ways that take calls for economic justice, environmental justice, racial justice, and gender justice seriously. Indeed, amen. And if nothing else, the combination of the Me Too movement of the last several years, so long overdue, the Black Lives Matters uh, surge of the last uh, 15, 16 months in the U.S., but really globally, um, going back a half a dozen years, but with roots, of course, in the civil rights movement in the U.S. in the 1960s, and all of the disruptions uh, uh, it c- caused by COVID, but not really caused, exposing and exacerbating longstanding inequalities really show us um, that the way that we have thought about business and human rights too often has been too narrow. And I think that this field now is irreversibly going to be integrated with the broader range of economic, social, and cultural issues. But the caution I offer, and this is really the pivot to the second brief passage of Erica's that I want to read and comment on, is that as we broaden um, the business and human rights agenda and take into much greater account inequality, poverty, the issues that Professor Alston has so brilliantly illuminated um, over the last decade or more, but uh, racial justice, gender justice, let's not please lose sight of the fundamental basics of political and civil rights and corporate accountability in that regard as well. And that brings me to the second, it's actually two sentences that I want to read from this very same epilogue, um, page 338, not that this is a, a, a biblical text, but the rising tide of authoritarianism and nationalism in some countries also presents risks. Yet it is precisely these challenging conditions that make it critically important for the business community to conduct the human rights due diligence necessary to better understand how business practices and policies impact the the enjoyment of human rights, address any adverse impacts, and reimagine better ways of doing business in ways that respect and promote human rights. Again, amen and right on. But the rising tide of nationalism and authoritarianism, I think, along with the intensification of the global climate crisis, is the biggest meta-historical story the world has faced in the last half dozen to even a dozen years. The tide of populism, extreme nationalism, authoritarianism, autocracies acting with greater impunity, democracies uh, sliding to uh, populist nationalism, and in some, I dare say, borderline fascism is troubling beyond belief. And the challenges that those geopolitical, meta-historical trends pose for all of us, not least for those of us who care about corporate accountability, could not possibly be more profound. This business and human rights agenda, movement, architecture that Erica does such a perfectly comprehensive, incisive job of, of, of documenting and analyzing in this book is no longer going to live in the box it's more or less been in the last two decades. The last decade since the guiding principles, many of us gathering annually, uh, now virtually, but physically in Geneva for the UN Annual Forum for Business and Human Rights, those days are over. We are now in the middle of not just business and human rights that we may have known and done 5, 10, 15, or 20 years ago. We're amidst geopolitical cross pressures that are going to force, are forcing multinational corporations in particular to decide who they are, what they stand for, how they're going to affect rights holders, stakeholders, shareholders. We see this playing out dramatically 
now as we approach the Beijing Olympics and the stands that Olympic sponsors thus far are not taking. Um, but welcome now to the new world of business and human rights and geopolitics. There's no going back and it's time for business to stand up for the shared space of rule of law, accountable governance, civic freedoms, and yes, first and foremost, human rights. And Erica's book takes us to this point now we go forward, uh, but it is a struggle. Thank you, and I again salute Erica. Thanks, Bennett, for, for a, a wonderful uh, conclusion to this series of comments. Um, because um, I mean, your suggestion is uh, we can't see this issue uh, as separate from all the other crises that are taking place, whether it's environmental crisis. Uh, whether it's racism, whether it's nationalism, all the contradictions, isn't it? Of a world that is completely globalized and the corporation has been central in creating that globalized world. And at the same time, we have the rise of nationalism. And then we have the pandemic, uh, which is, you know, <laughs> which is creating all, all sorts of other complicated issues. We have desperate developing country, I know that we haven't discussed it much, but desperate developing country governments, which in themselves are quite often complicit in the violations being committed by corporations. So we've, we've been focusing on corporations, but in a situation now, especially with the financial crisis that is going to accompany, that has accompanied the pandemic, we have governments that are desperate for any kind of investment, no matter what the terms, and you know, so on we go. But um, uh, thank you also for the wonderful um, uh, summary and recognition of uh, all that Erica has done. And Erica, I think we should leave the last word for you. And uh, I should also uh, bring to your notice some of the interesting questions that have appeared in the chat. You know, so one of the questions uh, is about, um, uh, you know, how, well, uh, perhaps I'm, inter I'm interpreting this, but, you know, one of the questions is, uh, you know, if we're talking about corporate social responsibility, are we presuming a particular cultural and economic milieu? In other words, the argument could be, if China is going to be a major global actor, you know, what would corporate social responsibility mean? You know, to the, the trillion dollars or whatever it is being spent on the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, is that one reason why we need a treaty, a global treaty? You know, because corporate social responsibility can work in certain circumstances, you know, and, um, you know, um, and, you know, uh, corporations in the West might say, we're going to be at a huge disadvantage. You know, it's like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, in some respect. Uh, I think there's an interesting question. Uh, Bennett has already sort of suggested this about, you know, China and corporates, uh, you know, the, the Olympics and, uh, co you know, how corporations should respond to that. Um, you know, so, so many tough questions. So I'm happy to leave them all to you, Erica, in your closing comments. Um, yes, there are some wonderful questions in this chat. Some would be well directed to members of this panel. Um, Ryan, you're acknowledged here, and there are questions about private companies versus public companies. Um, appreciation of your honesty. Um, Lauren Hansen, one of my former human rights students, asking about how these frames are shifting and actions that governments could recognize could do to get baseline measures. Um, Lauren, one would be having mandatory reporting on or integrated reporting on what businesses are doing both in the environmental and social context. The reports I analyzed are purely voluntary, largely unregulated. They say what they wanna say and are corrected by civil society activists. What if it were the case that we had integrated into how we think about what business is supposed to be doing precisely these kinds of social environmental concerns that um, people like Ryan are working towards in reality. Um, my colleague from Earth Justice, Fern Shepard, has made observations about the Winter Olympics in China. And my sister, um, Monica, has asked about how we go about pressurizing big business um, and getting more involved. And this is precisely the kind of question I want to get about getting more involved. Um, it can start as simply as asking a question about where something comes from. Um, when I interviewed businesses, they were concerned when um, somebody went on a Twitter rampage about poor customer service. Um, so you'd be surprised at how much leverage you can get, um, particularly if more influential people took this issue up. And I hope that this book will contribute to that conversation. Um, 
I will conclude um, thanking this panel and thanking Bennett for pointing to the epilogue that actually was written at a time after the book was submitted. So I wanted this positive picture of everything moving forward, but then pandemic happened, the, the uprisings happened. So I was literally in my home during pandemic writing those final pages. And those were the things that were causing me anxiety as we had well, Trump trains running through the city. Um, I was seeing a lot of things that concerned me deeply, but I don't want to let go of the idea that we can be different, that we can reimagine, and that we can go through this time of reckoning where a lot has been revealed about the problems that we have been able to pretty effectively avoid until now that we, we need to address. And my hope is that more people, not just human rights lawyers, not just people um, who are conscious consumers and investors begin to see these connections. So um, that is what I, I can't say ended on, but maybe began again on. Um, John Ruggie, when he talked about his, the UN Guiding Principles, called it the end of the beginning. And here we are, 10 years forward, we'll be going um, forward. Um, Ryan has observed this is an inflection point. This is a very important time. The choices that we make now, the decisions, the things that we do um, will make a difference um, for good or ill. And my hope is that by incorporating rights, it will be better. It can be better. It has to be. I don't think we have an alternative at this point. Um, so I think that's the more positive note that I wanted to end on. Um, but this book really rests on the support and input of so many that I've interviewed, so many that I've interacted with this panel chief among them, and the support of dear friends and colleagues like Tony. So um, thank you for your interest. There's information about um, the book in the chat. There's also information about other writings that I've done on this topic. Um, anyone here on this panel, I would refer you to to learn more about this. Um, and the UN Working Group's webpage is a wonderful resource as well. So I think after this presentation um, is recorded and available to you, we will put resources on the webpage as well for those who want to learn more and get involved. Um, also, um, environmental issues, I think, is a place that we need to be expanding as business and human rights. Much of our work is being folded into what businesses are calling broad sustainability. Um, I don't think it's an accident that so many of the people who've suffered human rights violations have been environmental activists trying to raise early alarms about what we face now. So um, in many ways, this book is for all of you who care about these issues, but certainly those who um, paid an ultimate price and it costs them their lives. Um, we can do better. We have to. And I thank you and hope you'll join me. Tony, thank you. Thanks so much, Erica. And I think that's, you know, a very fitting note on which to end. And uh, thank you for everybody. Uh, thank you to everybody for the wonderfully stimulating comments. Uh, we could go on for much longer. Let me also thank the, uh, the administrative uh, and techno technology people who made this all possible. <laughs> you know, uh, they play a very important role in all this as well. And uh, Dean Trunk Warner for supporting this, and you know all, all our wonderful colleagues at the University of Utah, uh, who are very proud of you, Erica. Thank you so much, and many congratulations again. Mm -hmm. Thank you.